All right, so uh, let's make a start. <clears throat> so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Alex. I'm an engineer on the GNU Toolchain team at ARM. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about Morello GCC. So we're going to start by giving a brief introduction to Cherry and Morello to explain what these are. Uh, then I'm going to be talking about what we've been working on uh, with regards to the toolchain and where we're up to. Then we're going to dive into some of the implementation details in GCC, and we'll, we'll cover some selected issues found in porting GCC to Morello. Uh, then Sabolsh is going to talk a bit about glibc, and finally we'll have some time for uh, Q&A at the end. So the idea is to give a feel for the sorts of problems that arise in this area and the work involved in introducing capabilities to the toolchain. So before I start, uh, we need to acknowledge the contribution of a large number of people at the University of Cambridge, SRI International, and elsewhere, together with their backers, for the development of the Cherry architecture, since, as I'll explain shortly, the Cherry architecture is the foundation on which Morello is built. So first up, let's talk about Cherry. So Cherry is a research project that came out of the University of Cambridge. They've been working on this for about the last 10 years or so. It stands for Capability Hardware Enhanced Risk Instructions. So to unpack this, we need to define what we mean by capability. In a very general sense, capabilities are communicable, unforgeable tokens of authority to access a resource. They're communicable in that they can be passed around within a system, and unforgeable in that they can't just be created out of thin air. They have to be derived from some valid means according to the rules of the system. In the case of Cherry, that means being derived in a valid way from another valid capability. So the idea with Cherry then is to take an instruction set and extend it with capabilities. We can then use these capabilities to implement some or all software pointers. So what's the point of this? Well, doing this allows us to achieve a couple of key security goals. The first of these is fine-grained memory protection, and the other is highly scalable software compartmentalization. Now, in this talk, we're going to focus on uh, the first of these two goals, since this is currently the most well understood with respect to how it can be deployed on today's software. So specifically with respect to memory protection, Cherry gives very strong referential integrity and spatial memory safety. Uh, at this point, it's also worth mentioning a couple of underlying security principles. Uh, so one of these is the principle of least privilege. This says that a given component of a system should hold the minimum privilege necessary to do its job. And in the context of Cherry, this can be implemented by a given software component being granted the smallest uh, possible capability that it needs to do its job. The other principle here is the principle of intentionality or intentional use, which states that given multiple privileges available to it, software should explicitly choose which one to exercise. And Cherry forces software to be explicit in this way as to which capability it uses to perform a given operation. Okay, so Morello. Morello is an instantiation of Cherry uh, in an experimental fork of the ARMv8A architecture. So it's also the name of a prototype board which implements the Morello architecture that ARM's developed. Concretely, the 64-bit general purpose registers in AR64 are extended to 129-bit capability registers in Morello. The capability registers hold an address in the low 64 bits and metadata in the upper 64 bits, together with an extra one-bit validity tag. When capabilities are stored in memory, the tag bits are stored on the side. The tag memory itself is not directly addressable. It can only be accessed indirectly through capability loads and stores. And the validity tag is preserved only by valid capability operations. Invalid operations on a capability cause the tag to be cleared. And once the tag is cleared, the capability can no longer be dereferenced. For example, overwriting a capability in memory with a non-capability store, or taking a capability sufficiently far out of bounds would invalidate the capability. That brings us nicely to bounds. So capability bounds encode a base and limit relative to the address. Uh, which allows out-of-bounds accesses to be trapped in hardware. Finally, we have permissions. These limit which operations a given capability can be used for, such as load, store, and instruction fetch. 
So there are a couple of important properties of Cherry systems that are enforced architecturally. One of these is provenance validity. It says that every valid capability must have been derived from another valid capability. So you end up with a sort of tree of derivations going back to the, the root capability in the system. Um, the other property here is monotonicity. This says that capability derivations cannot increase in privilege. So on this slide, we've got a simplified illustration of how such a tree might look, uh, showing some of the different kinds of capabilities in a typical user space process. On the left, we have uh, heat memory. Um, so the, the libc will initially get heat memory from the kernel via a syscall such as mmap. And then when user code calls malloc, um, that will further narrow the bounds of the capability to the size of the allocation requested by the user. Um, at this point, I should also mention that each of, the, each of the solid arrows here is a monotonically decreasing capability derivation. Um, so then we have uh, stack variables where the situation is slightly different. Um, here the compiler actually inserts instructions in order to narrow the bounds on, on stack variables. And finally, we can see how global variable access works on Morello here. Um, so initially at startup, the kernel grants the dynamic linker a capability to the program data sections. Um, each of the capabilities, uh, global variables, sorry, um, then has a, a capability size slot in the got. Um, and the dynamic linker can then populate those got slots with an appropriate narrowed capability. The, P, the got itself can then be accessed with a PCC relative load. Um, so just as a final note here, since the names CSP and PCC might be unfamiliar, these are just the capability versions of the AX64 stack pointer and program counter registers. Okay, so now that we've introduced Cherry and Morello at lightning speed, we can now talk about how to take advantage of the architecture from C and C++. So to effectively map C and C++ to the architecture, there are some modest language extensions needed. The simplest way to take advantage of the architecture is with what's known as the Pure Capability ABI. This is where all pointers and references are implemented using capabilities. This includes implied pointers, such as the stack pointer, and vtable pointers in C++. Arguably the biggest change with Cherry, C, and C++ is around the input a T type. Clearly, the type has to be able to carry pointers, and therefore capabilities. However, the type also has to behave like an integer type, and permit arbitrary integer arithmetic. To support this, we introduce a new int cap type, which is used to implement input a T in the pure capability API. So on the bottom of this slide, we have an example that shows some of the features of Cherry C. Line three illustrates an important point. In Cherry C, integer types such as long can no longer be used to hold pointers. When we cast from an integer type, such as long, to a pointer type, the compiler will warn that the resulting pointer will never be dereferenceable. At runtime, the resulting capability will be null-derived, meaning that the validity tag is cleared, and dereferencing the pointer will trap. Line four raises an interesting question. Should pointer comparison compare all 129 capability bits, or should it just compare the lower 64 bits containing the address? Uh, in Cherry C, we just compare the address values. This was found to give the least surprising semantics. Pointers that point to the same location will then always compare equal, regardless of their provenance. Line five shows an interesting case that arises with ink cap types. Unlike with pointer arithmetic, Int cap arithmetic permits binary operations with both sides carrying capabilities. In such a case, it is unclear from which side of the expression the resulting capability should be derived. So the compiler behavior here is to omit a warning, and by default, provenance will be carried from the left-hand side. Uh, yes, there's a question, I think. Yeah. Um, Um, uh, wouldn't it make more sense for the operation to result in the least capabilities, and comparing both sides and then taking the, the least permissive? Um, that's neat. I mean, I, yeah, I'll, have, I'll, have to, I'll have to think about that and get back to you offline. But that, that is that is not how this uh, yeah, how, how this is defined. Um. So one problem with that is you probably can't work it out statically. So there would be a performance impact. Yes. Um, but it's also probably pretty meaningless in most cases. 
to actually add two capabilities together. Yeah, I suppose thinking about it more, if you've got, if you've got um, you, you, the case that comes up quite often is you have an offset and you have uh, a pointer, but both are stored in, 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 in cap types, then the problem is, yeah, like Richard says, you can't work out statically, which... which um, Yeah, exa exactly. So you, you have to choose one of them from. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's the pure capability ABI. Um, I'm going to talk about hybrid now. So yeah, in addition to the pure capability ABI, there's another way to map C to Morello, uh, the so-called hybrid capability mode. So one motivating use case for this is where you have, for example, um, a very large code base, which would be non-trivial support to the pure capability ABI but you'd still like to be able to interface with capabilities at some well-defined boundary. An example of this is with the Morello Linux kernel. Hybrid mode permits supporting a pure capability user space ABI without having to port the entire Linux kernel to PureCap. To make use of capabilities from hybrid C, you then have to explicitly annotate those pointers with underscore underscore capability, as in the example below. Um, and I believe the Linux kernel port actually uses the, uh, the user, underscore underscore user annotation to um, uh, define that to, to, to this capability um, keyword. Okay, so how easy is it to port code to Cherry? Well, it really depends on what sort of software you're talking about. At one end of the spectrum, you might have some high level standards conforming well written user space software. And this kind of software is typically very easy. Um, or, should require minimal porting effort. At the other end of the spectrum, you have low-level software, such as uh, compilers, operating system kernels, um, and language runtimes. These kind of software tend to require more significant porting effort. In general, any code that plays tricks with pointers and makes assumptions about their underlying representation is potentially problematic. Um, so there's an example here um, taken from GCC. So this is a merge sort, part of a merge sort implementation in GCC. Uh, we're doing the merge set of the merge sorts. So we have pointers L and R that point to our recursively sorted subarrays. Um, we do a comparison and we form a mask from that comparison. So in the case where um, in the case where R compares less than L, uh, the mask is all ones. So we compute Ls or Ls or R. The Ls cancel out, and we end up with LR holding a pointer to R. Otherwise, if the comparison falls the other way. Uh, the mask is zero, so we compute L's or zero, and we end up with a pointer to L. So ignoring capabilities for a moment, the code works fine, right? But we think about this in terms of capabilities. Uh, one redeeming feature of the code is that it actually uses input a T, so the type can at least carry capabilities. Um, the problem here is that when we compute L's or R, the code is logically trying to create a capability that has the provenance of both pointers combined. Um, but this simply isn't possible with Cherry. Compiler has to choose one of the capabilities from which the result will be derived. In this case, the compiler will warn that the provenance is ambiguous and default to taking the provenance from the left hand side. In the case where we want to choose L, i.e., when the mask is zero, uh, the code happens to work by accident. So on line three, we compute L's or zero, um, and since the provenance defaults to coming from L, uh, we end up with the original capability we had for L. However, in the case where R compares smaller than L, things go wrong. The final LR pointer is derived from L, so although we compute the correct address value, R, the provenance is wrong. Um, the capability bounds uh, <laughs> permissions and so on are inherited from L. Do we have a question? Well, of course, in this specific example, the provenances of L and R will be the same because they are pointers into the same array because it's a sorting routine, right? So it always happens to do actually the right thing even if always taking the provenance from L, because it's going to be the same as R. So problem solved here. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, so couldn't this be, um, if you have, uh, do, the, do, do, do these necessarily have to be um, allocated soon? Yeah. Okay, so let's move on from that. So 
Um, so now that we've uh, had a little look at Cherry C and C++, we can talk a bit more about what we've been working on with our port of the GNU tools. So to give some context for the work, uh, Cambridge University have already developed a relatively mature software stack for Cherry based on LVM and a fork of FreeBSD called CherryBSD. Um, so this means we have a reference implementation of Cherry C and C++ in the form of Cherry LVM. Initially, ARM software efforts focused around porting LLVM to Morello, together with an Android-based software stack. And to further prove out the architecture, we've been working on a port of the GNU toolchain, and elsewhere in ARM, a port of the Linux kernel. In addition to proving out the architecture, it's also useful to show the notion of Cherry C and C++ is actually portable between implementations. So we've been working on the GCC port since around August 2020, so for about two years now. Uh, we also have ports of binutils, gdb, glibc, and ulib. Uh, so we, port, we support hybrid capability code gen from C, and GCC can build the Rollo Linux kernel in this mode. And we support pure capability code gen from C and C++. And GCC can build ulib, glibc, and libc++ for pure cap. Uh, so due to time constraints, there are some features that we don't currently support, such as OpenMP and the sanitizers. And then at the bottom of the slide, we have some pointers to where you can find uh, the work in the various upstream branches. Okay, so I'm going to talk about capabilities in GCC. Um, so at this point, uh, I should note that Richard Sanford did the design for GCC. Um, so we're indebted to him, and I can't take any credit for what follows, except for all of the mistakes, of course. Um, so introducing capabilities in GCC presents several challenges, and addressing these requires changes across the code base. We have to break two very widely held assumptions in GCC. The first of these is that pointers and scalar integers are interchangeable. This is no longer the case with capabilities. The second of these is that addresses and address offsets have the same mode. So breaking this assumption particularly affects the RTL parts of the compiler, where we have to tease apart which components of an address calculation are the offsets and which is the base address. We also have to ensure that all pointers are well-derived and that they have valid provenance. In practice, this means you can no longer just convert from an integer type and expect to get a valid pointer. We forbid such conversions in the compiler, and the compiler will ice if they're attempted. The point that we mentioned earlier is that the Cherry C and C++ semantics for pointer comparison just compares the address values as opposed to entire capabilities. So we have to make sure we do this correctly whenever we form comparisons on capabilities in the IR. So to represent capabilities in RTL, we introduce a new mode class. Capability modes are defined by their size in bits and the mode of the address value, also known as the offset mode of the capability. For Morello, we define the cap capability mode caddy mode as a 128-bit capability with a DI mode address value. To get the address value of a capability, an offset mode low part subreg is used. For a pure capability target, we then set P mode to be a capability mode. We also introduce a new macro called PO mode, which is the offset mode of P mode. For non-capability targets, these modes are the same, but the distinction is important for capability targets. Of course, we then have to update the usage of these macros throughout the middle end and the AX64 backend as part of this work. We also introduce a new mode classification, scalar adra mode, which is the set union of capability modes and scalar integer modes. Finally, we introduce some new RTL codes. Const null is used to represent the null capability. So arguably the most important feature of the const null is that it has a mode, so we avoid all the usual pain of GCC modeless constants. Um, pointer plus is introduced to be used for capability point arithmetic at uh, the RTL level. So unlike plus RTXs, this RTX requires its operands to have different modes. And as a consequence, it's also non-commutative. Replace address value is mainly used to implement int cap arithmetic, although it does also have other uses. And finally, we have a line address down, which really just does what it says on the tin. Okay, and of course, we also need to introduce capabilities at the tree level. So a tree type is considered a capability type if its type mode is a capability mode, and the type itself is not an aggregate. There are two main kinds of capability types, pointer types and int cap types. 
So we introduce a new tree code to represent the language level cherry income types. The address value of a capability can then be obtained directly by just converting to its non-capability type. However, as I mentioned earlier, conversions in the other direction are forbidden. So attempting to directly convert from an integer to a capability will lead to an ice. So instead, we introduce a new internal function, replace address value. This takes a capability C from which the result should be derived and sets its address value to the integer CV. In the case where there is no valid capability from which to derive, for example, if user code converts an integer to a capability, then we derive from the null capability. The result won't be dereferenceable, but it will have the correct address value. At the bottom of the slide, we show some key functions that we introduced in the tree API. Uh, so unsurprisingly, capability type P simply tests if its argument is a capability type. Uh, Non-capability type, when given a capability type, returns the type of its address value. Otherwise, it just returns the argument unmodified. And drop capability uh, forms a conversion to uh, the address value given a capability argument, and otherwise just, again, returns the argument unmodified. And so this drop capability is mainly intended for use in the front ends. And then we also have a folding version of that, which is used uh, mainly in the middle end. Okay. So we have an example here, kind of an end-to-end -end example, um, with some in-cap arithmetic. So you can see the C front end uh, initially builds a replace address value call to implement the in-cap arithmetic. Um, then we, f we have to decide first from which side the provenance comes. So in this case, it's from, from the left-hand side, it's straightforward. Um, then we drop the capabilities on both sides before, before forming the expression for the new address value. Um, another thing to note here is that the save expras are quite important. So when I initially added the support to the front end, uh, we didn't have any save expras here. So any side effects on the ink cap C would then get evaluated twice. Um, but yeah, that's fine with those in. And then we have the gimple on the bottom right and uh, the Morello assembly we produced finally in the bottom left. Um, the SC value instruction here is short for set capability value. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things we learned while doing this work is around the notion of type precision, which is used throughout the compiler. So we learned that uses of this macro generally fall into two different classes. Sometimes code uses type precision when it wants to know precisely how many bits are needed to represent a given type. Other times, code uses type precision when it wants to calculate the range of values that can be represented by a type or indeed the precision with which arithmetic occurs on a type. So typically, these two notions of precision are one and the same. So certainly for integer types, um, the, its size and bits also determines uh, well, it's the same precision as at which arithmetic occurs, and it also determines the representable range of the type. Um, with capability types, this is no longer the case. Um, so in particular, with 128-bit capabilities on Morello, the precision as in the size of the capability is, of course, 128 bits. However, the precision with which arithmetic occurs um, and the precision which determines the range of representable values is only 64 bits. So really, we have a dichotomy of different notions of precision, and we have to tease this apart throughout all uses of type precision in the compiler. Uh, to, fa to, to facilitate this, we made the compiler ice if type precision is used directly on a capability type. And instead, we forced the use of one of two new macros, uh, type cap precision and type non cap precision. So these names could be changed later down the line, but for now, having these two new macros helps us to indicate clearly where, where we've made an explicit decision in, in the code. So as mentioned previously, uh, introducing capabilities to GCC involves significant changes across the code base. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a question over there. So from the point of view of things like read copy update, right? we need things like the uh, C++ language, uh, the, the, C ato the, the atomics. Um, so do you see uh, that you would need like 128 bit load and store in order to be able to support the, the C language atomics, to load and store those pointers? Um. I'm not actually familiar with that part of the architecture, so I'm, I'm not sure. The architecture supports 128-bit atomics, and yeah, it works. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, yes, as mentioned previously, uh, introducing capabilities to GCC introduces significant changes across the code base. Uh, so to simplify the task and gain confidence in the approach, we introduce a development aid in the form of a flag called mfake capability. This flag causes all pointers to be represented using capabilities in the IR. 
So this aspect is similar to the pure capability mode, but the difference is that we're still only generating AX64 code. The fake capabilities are still only 64 bits. So use of this flag allowed us to decouple introducing the concept of capabilities and the new IR constructs to GCC from the Morello-specific aspects, uh, such as having 128-bit capabilities and implementing the pure capability PCS. Um, it also allows for straightforward testing using uh, stock AX64 hardware. So once the test suite was mostly clean with mfake capability, we could then start on pure capability enablement. And more recently, we've now gained C++ support. Um, we also managed to get the compiler bootstrapping with this flag. Uh, so yeah, now I'm going to talk about just a few issues that we ran into when trying to port GCC to Morello. So first off, a little bit about bounds on Morello and how that affects the toolchain. Morello encodes capability bounds using a floating point style compression format such that the capability can fit into 128 bits. So as a result, not all combinations of base, address, and limit are representable. So this has implications for any software that allocates memory from Morello. In order to ensure we get tight bounds on capabilities, software has to insert padding and or increase alignment uh, such that the overall allocation size is exactly representable. This has implications for many toolchain components, including GCC, when it allocates memory uh, for both stack and global variables, as well as the static linker, which has to ensure that the span of the PCC within the DSO um, is precisely representable. It also affects glibc malloc and the various allocators in libc++. So here's an example of a transformation that GCC does, which is valid for integer pointers, uh, but it's wrong for capabilities. So this occurs due to an optimization in the AX64 backend called AX64 anchor offset, uh, which tries to create anchor points for address cal calculations that are out of immediate range uh, in the hope that the same anchor point can then be reused for other loads or stores. The Problem is that, as I mentioned earlier, cherry capabilities can only be taken so far out of bounds uh, before they lose the validity tag. On Morello, capabilities can only be taken 12.5% of the allocation size below the base uh, without getting invalidated. So in the example here, we would likely end up dereferencing an invalid capability and trapping. So to fix this, we currently disable the optimization um, for capabilities given a negative offset, and we adjust it for positive offsets to avoid using anchor points that would take the capability out of range. Um, so it would be possible to use a sort of round towards zero behavior here for negative offsets, but we, we don't do that currently just to try and keep things simple. Okay, and this is an interesting problem that we hit with the uh, C++ front end. So we have a nice, simple C++ program here, right? Nothing could possibly go wrong with this code. Well, as I mentioned earlier, with Cherry, comparisons on capabilities must compare only the address values, uh, not the entire capabilities. So therefore, when we build the IR for this uh, comparison, we first convert both sides to unsigned long. So the IR looks like what you see in the middle. Um, C++ then says that converting pointers to arithmetic types is invalid in a context for a context. So Morello GCC actually ends up rejecting this code, which is not so good. Um, so the problem here is that we, we can't really distinguish between uh, conversions that the user wrote in the original source and conversions that GCC inserted in order to get the correct semantics for capability comparisons. So to fix this, we, um, we use a C++ specific tree code to represent these implicit conversions uh, in the C++ front end. Uh, the context for interpreter can then distinguish these conversions um, from those written by the user and avoid diagnosing the implicit conversions. So when genericizing, we then lower the implicit conversions to convert expres. So this has no real impact outside of the C++ front end. One implication of doing this is that we also have to do some opportunistic lowering of the implicit conversions uh, in order to restore the folding that we would usually get with the front end. So of course the generic match PD folding uh, will only work on generic conversions. It, will, it won't recognize our C++ specific tree code. And interestingly, this context for a case seems to be the only case we ran into where making this distinction between user, user conversions and GCC inserted conversions uh, is important for correctness. Okay. Um, so that concludes this part of the talk, and now I'm going to hand over to Travolx. And um, before I do, just a quick note that you can try out Morello GCC on Compiler Explorer. So please have a go and try to break it. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, so I will have a few slides on glibc. Um, <clears throat> and then hopefully we'll have some little time at the end for questions. So the first thing I want to note is um, the starting point where the Morello glibc porting uh, started. Um, 
it was not the usual, uh, we have a working GCC and then start the GLIP supporting work. Um, instead, uh, because of the, of the history of the project, we already have a good LLVM-based toolchain, but not yet a GCC. And uh, we decided that we want to start GLIP supporting work as early as possible. So uh, it was a bit, we had to do a bit of extra work inside GLIPC to support Clang, LLD, uh, static linking, linking only in GCC, GLIPC. And also we had to work with the uh, uh, emulating Linux system call layer. At this point, uh, Linux kernel is 64 bit, user space is 128 bit pointers, so you have to translate types. Um, so yeah, it was a bit slow start. Um, um, the port, um, well, two important, one important thing about the port is that we keep it in a separate branch, so we're not intending to upstream it, which means in principle we could do all sorts of nasty hacks because upstream reviewers uh, don't have a say, but um, we try to make the patch set very clean because it makes it easier for us. Uh, only a few places where we cut corners. The other thing I want to mention is that in a norm there, that um, we essentially reuse a lot of code from AR64 because Morello is pretty much and like AR64 just with capabilities. Um, so some of the normal porting work we didn't have to do much work because it was uh, it was uh, already there, just little changes. Um, however, that we still had a lot of work to do, but not the usual uh, kind of backend uh, porting work. Uh, we had to change the generic C code um, quite a bit, but these, um, so some of the changes are very s small changes, but at many different places, and mainly because the Cherry C language is a different language from standard C. Um, as Alex mentioned, the, um, there are problems with integer types that represent capabilities. Um, somebody said it never makes sense to add two pointers. Well, sometimes it makes sense to add the pointer plus offset, and sometimes the offset is stored in the uint PTR for whatever reason, and then you have UNT PTR plus UNT PTR. So these kind of situations happen in the uh, GLIPC source code. Um, we also have issues because 128 bit uh, pointers uh, size, uh, GLIPC is not always prepared for that. And you have to change the atomics as was mentioned. Um, yeah, so there were some small changes. Oh, and yeah, GLIPC ha GCC has warnings about some of the issues. I decided to not try to make GLIPC clean off uh, the cherry specific warnings because there were lots of false positives and it required me to change the code in unnatural ways to silence all the warnings. And uh, yeah, so the warnings at this point is, was not super helpful. Um, now, another class of problems that you might be wondering, that the previous set of things were GLIPC internal little changes just to make capabilities work. But sometimes we have to make changes that uh, the public interfaces are affected and that uh, more, can be more interesting because that affects uh, uh, user code and the portability of user code. We only had to introduce one new interface, get, uh, essentially get AuxVal. We want get AuxVal to be able to return a pointer and we introduce an interface for that. And we did some minor change in printf to be able to print uh, uh, capabilities in a pretty format. Uh, okay. Um, just curious, uh, does the implementation 
of the loads and store of this 128-bit pointer use the equivalent of link load store conditional, or does it use the atomics of the, the architecture? Uh, just, uh, just uh, so my, I just read a few bugs on the GCC uh, bug tracker. So my concern is that you might be using uh, something that is an atomic operation for storing or loading those 128-bit value, but that the microarchitecture does not do it uh, atomically. So you might be having races in, in software code that expects atomics. So the 128-bit capability load store is an architecturally uh, built-in thing, and the atomics are for that is also built in to the architecture. So uh, I would expect that to work because, yeah, software relies on that. Um, anyway, we have a lot of problems before getting to such details. So um, yeah, so we only need, we only need a little bit of changes, a new interface type of change. But the more important thing is that there are behaviors that were, oh, the capability architecture doesn't allow this, and this will be exposed to users, so user code have to be now careful around that. One obvious case is when you copy pointers in memory, memcopy has to be special, and uh, uh, we had to change memcopy to be special, but user can also copy uh, pointers. and. Uh, and similarly, there are point, problems with pointers in shared memory. People use that. And passing pointers around uh, one moment around uh, 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 I.O. or file descriptors. So I'm, I'm probably not, not really sure. Is the, the when, when I, I have a structure in, G, in, in, in C, and there's a pointer in it, will that be 128 bits? So is the capability stored in my user memory? Because at the very beginning, I thought the capabilities were only accessible via some special... So, so, so I, I can actually like store a pointer with capability in memory, then use some character stores to mangle the capability and load no. it back, and what if you, if you use character stores on the, on, on, on the capability, then, then it will invalidate the capability. So you, have to, you can only use capability loads and stores to, to load and store from uh, capabilities to and from memory. Um, so you, we have a full set of loads and stores that you can use when, in the PureCap API. Uh, can I? Can I pick up on one of the first things actually on the previous slide? You've said you're going to keep this all in a branch. Um, I always worry about things that live in a branch and never see, you know, become part of mainstream. I think you're doing three things. You're providing generic support for Cherry capabilities. You're providing support for Cherry on um, ARCH64. And you're providing support for the Morello board that supports Arch. So you've got a board, you've got an architecture, you've got a general yeah. functionality. Now, I understand, and for those who don't know, the, the British government's put about 170 million, I think, into this project. It is a big national strategic event. The Morello board's only gonna last for five years because it's a research project. But the idea is that Cherry, Cherry, I mean, capabilities have been around for 30 or 40 years already. Yeah. Um, it seems strange to not at least get the, the core Cherry stuff upstream, uh, fully into right. the main so, branch. Yeah, okay, so um, the, so all of the stuff we've done in, in GCC is, is uh, designed to be uh, target independent, so we've, and we've written the code in such a way that we hope it's of the kind of quality that could be upstreamed, um, but the reason we're not upstreaming it right now is because, um, well, Morello is a fork of the architecture, it's not, it's not the mainstream um, ARMv8 in architecture, so it's that's that's why we've kept it in a branch for now. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers the question. Do you have QMU and Valgrind support? For um, the Morello, I guess? So there's uh, we've, yeah, this ARM has fast models for um, emulating, but there's also um, I believe Cambridge University have a, a, a port of QMU to uh, Morello and other Cherry targets. So.
All right, I will try to speed up. So there are some things that become clear during, during the zero time porting that will be visible to, to uh, users. Uh, uh, something that I haven't mentioned is some types change. It doesn't affect many interfaces, but a uh, few interfaces. Uh, of course, if the interface has different type, uh, as the documented type uh, for current targets, uh, then portable code might be affected by that. And there are also system call APIs that have significantly different here that might be visible in user code. Uh, yeah. All right, so, so far I mostly talked about like little Loc uh, localized issues inside uh, uh, GLPC, but there were a few uh, bigger changes where we had to do some design work or uh, 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 yeah, do some uh, bigger changes. Uh, the first issue is how all the capabilities get derived at program startup. Um, the current kernel um, gives us user space a capability that essentially covers the ad entire address space, which means any time we have an address, we can just turn that into a valid capability. So we don't have to worry too much at this point, uh, at the beginning. So we kind of did a two-phase implementation when first we tried to make the Morello port work with 128-bit pointers and if there is any point where we really need a capability, we can just make that up. And then there was a phase two when we use the real root capabilities that, um, that are there, that, that will be there in the final, uh, final kernel, where there are narrow capabilities that come from AUX vector, PCC, or stack pointer. Um, a bigger issue is the dynamic linker. What do we do? Uh, how do we handle capabilities in a dynamic linker? Um, one problem there is the dynamic linker works a lot with addresses and assumes that 64-bit addresses on a 64-bit LF platform can be just cast to a pointer and it will work. And of course, we want capability. Um, and most of the time, these when in an ELF module, we want a pointer somewhere inside the ELF module, the computation that uh, the dynamic linker is doing is have a base address plus some offset. So the natural thing to change was to make the base address a capability, and then base address plus offset immediately gives you uh, a capability that kind of works. Um, so that, that was the phase one uh, dynamic linker work. We just changed a few types from 64-bit address into unit PTR, essentially. And then phase two is when um, in the final um, design we wanted two separate capabilities uh, for covering um, the, the load segment uh, of an ELF executable, but only with read execute per permission. And and another capability with read-write permission that only covers the, the writable segments. And uh, then we had to make a bit more changes to ensure that the, all the pointers are derived from the right capability within an ELF module. Um, another big area uh, where there, there are more changes needed is, is the malloc design because you would expect malloc to give you uh, give you user a pointer that has only able to access the the, the allocated area. Um, in the first phase when we uh, worked on malloc, we just wanted to make it work because there are internal integer casts inside malloc which were not perfect. Just clean that up, make malloc work and no bounds narrowing. Then the second step was, okay, implement the bounds narrowing where we had the problem of representation 
not all sizes can be represented, so sometimes the malloc size have to be increased a bit, so it's representable. So now there is the security property that the user gets the pointer with the right bound, but we have a problem at free, because in free you get a user pointer and you want to access the malloc metadata, and the pointer do doesn't have access to that metadata. So we have to somehow create a cap capability that does have access to the metadata. So the phase two is just to make sure that, okay, we can access the metadata. And there is a phase three when, when actually we change the free that we don't rely on a, a, a magic global capability that has access to everything. Instead, uh, we have some data structure to, to do this kind of transformation from user pointer to an internal some capability that has access to the metadata. Ideally, you would design malloc very differently for Morello, but we wanted to kind of do this the minimal design, and we are currently working on phase three. So at, from this slide, um, everything phase two is already implemented. Uh, it's not yet all in the branch, but yeah. Uh, yes, so the status, uh, I run the test suite, as, although uh, this test suite run was done uh, with the GCC that haven't yet implemented the stack bounds. If I, if I use the stack bounds, then there are more fa failures. Apparently, glibc have some out of bound access on the stack. And uh, yeah, and there is the list of the failures that are currently present in the test suite. Uh, it's some elf features are missing. Uh, uh, profiling is missing. There is an unbinder bug that we know about and know how to fix, but we just haven't fixed it yet. And so there are a number of known issues, and those are the remaining failures. So most things work at the current kernel, uh, but there are no strong security guarantees. So, like, um, we haven't went through the uh, seed on time to narrow all the all the object bounds, like there was this question about QSort passes down the pointer to a compare function. Does QSort narrow down the pointer before passing down the compare function or passes down the array pointer? The Cherry people has some work on this. Uh, I haven't went through that. What, what uh, is there? Uh, 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 yeah, we haven't went through all the security hardening that they propose. So. Yeah, and that's it, I think. And uh, these are the people involved in the porting work. And uh, yeah, I think we have time for questions. Um, I remember you mentioning about the capability that it has 138 bits and one tag bit that is not accessible. Uh, when debugging using GDB, would we be able to see that tag bit? So the way GDB works is you can print out capabilities in a pretty format, and it prints out the capability, the bounds information. Capabilities also have permission information, read, write, execute, and a bit more, because for whatever reason. And, uh, and it also prints out if the capability is valid. So it's just you can print out if a capability is valid or not, and GDB knows how to query that bit from the operating system. So I just want to validate my understanding of, of the attack scenario that you care about. So if I get it right, so if someone gets a pointer and start flipping those capability bits in user space to try to make the access, you don't care about that kind of attack scenario, right? You just care about, I guess, someone getting the pointer and using it in the rightful way with the right accessors to modify it. But I mean, it, I have access to the binary representation if I'm a program, right? I could flip the bits. If you flip a bit and not using the architectural load store instructions that are capability load stores, then the capability validity, validity bit, which is stored elsewhere, that will be invalid. So as soon as you try fiddling with the bits of a capability, it becomes invalid. 
Yeah, and to, to be clear, you can't set the tag bit from, from user space. Um, but user space, there's no instruction to do that. So is it kind of, if, if there's a pointer in memory somewhere, there is, for each memory location, there is a bit somewhere telling, uh, is there a valid pointer there or not? Exactly, except um, one thing is that the pointer alignment requirement is 16 byte. So for every 16 byte, the capability is 16 byte, for every 16 byte in memory, there is somewhere a bit that says, is this a valid capability or not? Yeah. Sorry. The memory is, is like stored to with any invalid instruction, then it is clear. Yes. Yeah. And so I, I was curious on earlier points of one of them was the mem copy has to be special case. What does that exactly mean? Like, do you look through the types and what exactly do you do? Yes, yeah, so mem copy simply goes, does the copying, but for every 16 byte line, 16 byte has to go through a capability load and capability store operation. And that means if there was a pointer somewhere in the copied struct that it remains valid on the output. And you somehow force the library memcopy implementation for all the internal copying by GCC, because GCC has many ways how to expand a copy yeah, of so something, either piecewise or... Yeah, we, we had to fix the inline memcopy expansion as well to preserve capabilities, so it, yeah, it, it, either approach should work. Hmm? Yeah, uh, yeah. If you sure, if you spill a if you spill a pointer to yeah, um, that, that has to use capability loads and stores if it's a capability pointer. Can GDB forge capabilities? Can you give it the address of the bounds or whatever you want so that it forges a capability through P trace or something like that? I think the Cambridge people, uh, university people, really don't like that idea, but uh, there is a setting in uh, like a proc file system or proc sys sysfs, some setting on Linux that allows you to forge capabilities in a pre ptrace thing setup, and uh, you can turn it off or on. Um, I think that's the situation. Yeah. I was wondering if the semantics of the restrict keyword need to change in any way for, for this to be, if you have two pointers which were, which were using the um, capability semantics and they are now dis declared restrict, does the compiler need to do something extra or do the semantics have to change? I, I cannot reason it out, so I thought I'll ask away. <laughs> I don't think we had to change anything around restrict. No, I don't. Well, it, yeah, we haven't. I, pers I haven't thought about that, but we. I don't think we made any changes in that area. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think, off the top of my head, they would need to change. But yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if you need to. That's what I was thinking. I'm not sure. <clears throat> Um, so the we can't, we, we can't assume that they're, sorry, do you, do you want to go shut off? Um, okay. Okay, so the question is uh, pointer LES or not LES, what, what does that happen? What, what happens then with capabilities? How does capabilities change those situations? So, and uh, I think capabilities just ensure that 
each pointer can only access its own within own own bounds. And uh, if there's some aliasing issue that's separate, like aliasing issue uh, that happens without capabilities and uh, with capabilities that capabilities doesn't, don't change that. Uh, yeah. It just prevents you to do out of bound access. Yeah, I think if you've got two pointers that could uh, point to the same place but have different provenance, then we have to assume in the compiler that they, that they do alias. Um, it doesn't change that, um, So even if they have different provenance. So, so maybe a related question, the, the bounds, are they so that two capabilities are either completely distinct or can they overlap partially? Or can they only be contained or inside each other? So are they really r random ranges or are they in, in some way form a hierarchy or so? Yeah, each pointer can have its own bounds. And as, as long as it's representable, that pointer can have whatever bounds. Um, and yeah, that can be two different pointers that have overlapping bounds and things like that. However, if you have two pointers that have overlapping bounds, you cannot turn them into a super pointer that has all the bounds of them. So even though in principle you have capability to access the entire range, you can create a single pointer for that. Yeah. And obviously a, a well-behaved allocator should make sure that they're disjoint, the capabilities that it allocates, so you shouldn't have overlapping. So, so <clears throat> is it possible to like, Use a fat point, yeah, use capability pointer to iterate backwards through a buffer somehow, because the pointer has the address and the range like next to it. So intuitively, it shouldn't be possible to iterate like down. Is it right? Yes. Yeah, so the capability has essentially, in principle, three pointers. The actual value of the capability, the begin and the end. It's just compressed representation. So not every combination of three 64-bit pointer is representable. Uh, so it's perfectly possible that uh, have a capability that has a value that points to the end of the range of the accessible, uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, so just last question, I guess, is from Sidesh online in Zoom. Can some of the pointer arithmetic cleanups in malloc be upstreamed? Um, potentially, yes. Um, there are a smaller set of uh, cleanup patches, patches that I think are actually upstreamable, but we do have a long list of patches that I think are very cherry specific. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you.